Well, I'm in a uh, brief sermon series that I'm calling Kings and Princes, so that as we move toward the, the election day, that we have a sense of not how to vote, but how to think about our voting, how to think about those that we set aside in leadership. And, and even though this is not, it seems, at all a part of this entire election process, time was when people would be asking the question, who does God want us to vote for? <laughs> well, I think we ought to ask ourselves that question in the privacy of our, of our own hearts and lives. Who is God setting aside to lead? Not just as president and vice president, but all the way down the ballot, who might God be setting aside? And so as we, as we ponder those kinds of questions, we have to ponder some of the deep issues that have been preserved for us by the, the entire story and the history of God's people. Because the ultimate culmination of their longing for a king was a king like David, who was to be the, the Messiah, the Christ, our Lord. So Samuel the prophet has rejected Saul. Saul was set aside as the first king of Israel, but he was kind of nibbling on the edges. He was doing some things for himself, but saying it was for everyone, saying he was obedient to God, but not entirely. And so Samuel rejects him. Saul is still king, and Samuel goes down to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse. It's a little like that old Bonanza show that we used to love, you know? So, so Jesse's down there with his boys and their ranch, and, and he goes to Jesse and he says, the next king is going to be one of your boys. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from the prophet Samuel. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with olive oil. Go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. Well, take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and Say that you have come to make sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shimea. But Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? There's still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark, handsome, with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So David stood there among his brothers. Samuel took the flask of olive oil. He had brought an anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. 
And then Samuel returned to Ramah. So Samuel comes to town, comes into Bethlehem, and the people thought, this cannot be good. Anytime any kind of official who's in any way related to the, the big shots of Jerusalem, this can't be good. Here comes Samuel, this denominational authority. He's going to come in and mess up our lives. So they're afraid. And they said, no, 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 this is nothing to worry about. He's come with a particular purpose. And what is that purpose? Well, Samuel says, well, I've come to sacrifice. I made an arrangement with God to, to bring a sacrifice as cover for the real reason he came, because if he anoints a king while there's still a king in place, well, you can imagine when the jealousies emerge and the story of Saul and David going from that time forward is a, is a story of jealousy and, and intrigue and Saul's effort to kill David. And so Samuel comes and he brings himself, brings a heifer along with him and they sacrifice. And everyone's happy, everyone goes home. And then he says to Jesse, and it's just Jesse, says, I've come to anoint one of your sons as the next king. So Jesse begins to call his boys over. First is Eliab, and Eliab has lettered in three sports. He's got a 3.8 GPA, and, and he comes in, he's tall, he's got his letterman's jacket on with all of those sports symbols and everything else, and, and, Jess, and Samuel saw him and thought, ha, we need to look no more. Here's the guy. And then the Lord reminded Samuel, you remember Saul, he looked like that. Tall, powerful, handsome, and all that. Don't look at the outside stuff. Even pay no attention to the outside. Because the Lord looks at the heart. And how we must remind ourselves of that all the time. The Lord looks at the heart. When I was up in Milford, Michigan, preaching for my son, now, mind you, my, as I've shared with you before, my son has his, in his congregation these General Motors executives that live in the exurbs of Detroit. And then he's got the beer t-shirt crowd. And they're all in the same church. Well, there was one young man who had just finished his God and Country medal, or patch, or whatever they give Boy Scouts. <laughs> the cutest boy. And he, Bryant brought him up to go through this little ritual, and he had this spiked mohawk like this, <laughs> shaved around. And, and, and afterwards, in Fellowship Hall, I saw his dad. His dad had a t-shirt on and cargo shorts, and he had a spiked mohawk, just like his boy. And I thought, this is a good reminder. We don't judge people by how they present themselves. We just don't do it, even though there's an impulse to do that. Well, look at him. The Lord looks at the heart, and so are we. And when I saw that father, and I had seen that son, my mind and my eyes were given a special glimpse at the heart of that father. What boy so closely emulates his father, but a boy who is so loved by that father? So we are reminded here, and this is a this is simply, it could be a throwaway passage in Samuel, but the reality is we are to consider the heart, look at the heart. So, son two, son three, seven boys come by, and none of them are worthy, none, none of them are fit. So Samuel says, is that all? As if what Samuel had seen was not impressive enough. Seven boys. 
very bright, capable young men. And then Jesse said, well, there's the kid. We don't even bring him in for stuff like this. He's, he's out in the field. Somebody has to watch the sheep. In the, he's out there. So Samuel said, bring him. And then came this young man, probably 13 or so years old, burned by the sun with bright eyes and a shock of black hair. And... And Samuel, when he saw him, heard the voice of God, this is the one. And so Samuel, without any talking, no ritual, no, no mumbo jumbo or hocus pocus or anything else, brought the father and the boys around. And then Samuel, and then Samuel stood in front of David, took his flask of oil, once again, no sanctifying words, nothing that looked or felt religious at all, and simply poured the oil over David. And the Spirit of God came upon David. Something happened in David where he knew somehow, some way, that the Lord had, had set, him, set him apart for a particular, particularly arduous calling in his life, and he joyfully entered in to that calling is the will of God. So David's life, as he begins in this position as the one who is anointed by God to be king, is profoundly humble. A beautiful boy. And he humbly accepts the challenge that God has given to him. And as the Lord's sovereignty would have it, he goes to play the harp for Saul because Saul's an emotional wreck. And so David would go and play his harp for Saul. And one thing led to another, and Saul realized that Samuel, pardon me, that, that David was beloved, and ba David was somehow so very special in the eyes of the Lord, and others in the court were beginning to look to David and appreciate him. And at one point, Saul takes his spear and tries to, tries to nail David with it. David runs away. He gets out of there. And Saul's son, Jonathan, helps him. David's on the lamb as Saul actively pursues him. And so, so David is, is out and a fugitive. At one point, there's this hilarious sort of scene of which, in which Saul has gone into a cave to relieve himself. And David sneaks in with a knife and cuts off the hem of his, of, of his robe, just a corner of his robe, and then gives it to him face to face, saying to him, if I were your enemy, would I give this to you? Would I not have thrust the knife into you rather than on your robe? But Saul couldn't hear it. So David runs again. Then finally Saul exercises his reign for himself, and finally, finally, it all crashes in upon him. And he is beaten on the field of battle, and the enemy is about to come and, and capture him, and Saul falls on his sword. That's where we get that phrase, falls on his sword. He, rather than submitting himself to the, to the defeat that he had suffered, defeats himself. And David comes out of hiding. David comes forth as the next king of Israel. And he actually recaptures the ark that the Philistines had captured and taken. And he goes and recaptures the ark. He brings it into Jerusalem. Now, let me simply say that before all of that, before he comes into Jerusalem, David had something of a change of attitude. He was kind of into women, or a lot into women. He started collecting wives for himself and concubines. And he was that kind of guy. <laughs> 
And so as he makes his way into Jerusalem, he's dancing before the, before the ark, but he also strips himself down to a loincloth in doing so. And one of his wives is up and, and watching all of this, and he had hell to pay when he got home. What a spectacle you have made of yourself, she said to him. All the women of Israel are looking on you, and they're not seeing some king. They're seeing a handsome, handsome, powerful young man. And what are you doing, David? Well, you know how this story unfolds. David is king. And somehow... All of that humility has drained out of him, and now it's all about him. Now he is king, and he can do whatever he wants to do. Why? Because he's king. And his young men are off to war. A good king is with his men. But David stays home. And... In the cool of the evening, as the breezes waft off of the Mediterranean, he stands on the roof of his palace and looks out. And there across the way is a woman bathing. And David takes Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, one of the great men of Israel, one of the great soldiers of the army, takes her to himself. And she becomes pregnant. He calls Uriah out back home from the front to try to cover his crime by having him stay with his wife, but no, he's a good soldier. He will not go in while all the other guys are stuck out there in the mud and the, the trenches. He's not going to violate his trust with those men. Instead, he sleeps outside. And so everyone knows it. Everyone sees it. And so David orders that Uriah be put in the heat of the worst kind of an assault and battle so that he and others others of the best of Israel would be killed just for him, just for his own sake. Now, the scripture speaks of David as a king, or as Jesus, as a king like David, that the people of God wanted a king like David. What on earth? Until the story unfolds further. Samuel's now gone. Nathan comes, the new prophet comes, and he walks into the court of the king, and I believe with deep anguish in his heart, tells this story of about a rich and powerful man taking a loving, a, a beloved lamb from a poor man and slaughters it for himself. And that poor man is left without. And David, in anger, says, that man should die. And then Nathan says, David, you are that man. You are the one who has done this. And David implodes. The little boy that is born dies on the eighth day, the very day of his circumcision. And David is left completely, utterly distraught, realizing that in his pride, in his usurping that role, in thinking himself above and, and untouchable, that he was in some place where he could call the shots now, that he had grievously sinned. And so his prayer is recorded in the 51st Psalm when David pleads with God, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And from that point, David found his humility once again. 
And yet, with all of God's redemptive work, all the consequences of his action begin to roll out. They roll forth. We realize we can be forgiven for something, but the consequences of our choices in this life still continue. It still rolls out. We can be forgiven for shooting somebody or, or violating somebody's very special dignity, but the person shot is still injured. The person violated is still hurt. We may be forgiven, but the consequences of our action roll out. And so it was for David. David had his eyes open once again in, his, in this place of humility. He could now see clearly again. And what he saw clearly was, it's not about me. Who am I? What am I? And yet the consequences roll forth. His son, Amnon, rapes his half-sister, Tamar. Another son, Absalom, goes and in vengeance kills Amnon. Then Absalom wants to, he is aspiring to be the king himself, and he rises up and forms a rebellion to overthrow his own father as king. And David sends Joab to capture him, not to kill him, but to capture him. And Joab, his commander, goes and kills Amnon, Absalom as Absalom is hanging from his long hair in the trees. And David is internally destroyed. He goes from distraught to destroyed. And at the end of his life, when it's all over and done, David goes out onto that rooftop once again. He looks out, is reminded of his life, his reign, his mistakes, his sin, and his grief. And he makes a declaration. The last words of David are, when one rules, he must rule in righteousness and it was not so in my house. It was not so under my reign. So David moved from humility to overwhelming destructive pride and finally to humility again. It was that humility that constituted the man after God's own heart. It was that one who ruled in humility that referenced the kind of reign that the people would begin to look for and hope for when they were looking from that time on for another one who would be like David. No one wants one who is going to stand in, a, in an isolated position all, uh, on high and act as a despot, acting out his will over against the reality and the will of God's people, over and against the reality of the will of God. We have plenty of despotism in our world. We know what it looks like, we know what it feels like, and it's repugnant to all people who would be free. But humility, when one rules in humility, when one listens, for the voice of God, when one defers being aware of where the people live, and most especially for the least of our brothers and sisters, can it not be that we as a culture will be ultimately judged by how we deal with the least of our brothers and sisters? Those on the margins, those who are hurting, those who are old, those who are so young, those who are handicapped, those who are hurting. 
that as a culture, as a people, as a society, if we're not caring for those who are on the boundaries, what are we doing? I received an email from Jack Timon, who's one of our one of our members. He and Lucille are up north right now, and responding to some of the mayhem going on in our cities, south side of Chicago and other such places. And Jack is the right-hand man to our congressperson, to our congressman, Kirk Clausen. And he, he wrote to me and he said, you know, it's, you pastors have to do something. Because these kids growing up in the inner city, what chance do they have when we have a structure of this and that that and, and no fathers in the home and a complete disintegration of anything that represents legitimate culture where children can grow up knowing that they're loved and protected and cared for. What chance do they have? And he said, I believe that the change must come from the pulpits pulpits of America. I thought, thanks, Jack. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> At the same time, I, I have some very dear African-American pastor friends that I'm in regular contact with, and they do have a voice in those communities and in those cultures, as I shared with you last week. But it is in humility that we, as a people, reflect that which is the most important sovereignty, the sovereignty of our God, the reign of God in the world. It is in humility that we reflect his presence, his power at work in our world not in prideful usurpation of power, but in humble listening and in righteous caring. And in that way, we raise up among us one that we hope might function among us as a people, not just one, but all through government, those who might be kings like David, senators like David, presidents like David, those who might rule in humility and care. Will you bow with me? Father, we have only human beings to choose from. And so guide us. We know the ongoing rearrangement of reput reputations, the rubble of reputations. Remind us, O oh Lord, that we, as your children, are to find those who might rule in humility and obedience to your Son. Remind us, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name.